temperature and up to about 500 degrees, and then it departs from the theory and then comes back at, uh, at the highest temperatures. But it, it's also a straight line, which does not agree with the, the theory. Um, and a reinterpretation of an early uh, single-pass merged beam experiment of Brian Mitchell's uh, puts the rate constant over here, and, and that clearly appears to be incorrect. Uh, a nice thing about estimating the, uh, the uh, rate constant this way is that instead of um, saying there's a, a constant uncertainty with electron temperature, which, which is not the case, uh, one can uh, show that the uncertainty, the uncertainty varies with electron temperature. And in fact, at the highest uh, uh, temperatures, you can see the upper limit on the uncertainty uh, was very close to the actual uh, calculated rate. These are the rate constants from individual vibrational levels. Uh, they're similar in, at very low temperatures. And I probably should extend these calculations to lower temperatures. The lowest one I have here is 100 K, uh, where it's possible that that vehicle one, that vehicle one level uh, might exceed the one for vehicle zero. But at room temperature, the rates are somewhat similar. But above room temperature, the vehicle zero rate is always greater than the vehicle two and the vehicle one rate. And another interesting thing from this is you can see for vehicle one, just by chance, over most of its range of electron temperatures, the rate coefficient has very little uncertainty. So that one can get away with moving potential curves around and, and uh, uh, electronic capture widths, and it doesn't change very much. And this is the, uh, this is the uh, rate uh, coefficient again for vehicle zero, now shown with vehicle three and vehicle four. You can see vehicle three and four are very similar over the whole range of electron temperatures, but vehicle zero is greater than, than those uh, over most of the temperature range above room temperature. Now, in the cry ring experiment, and in all the storage ring experiments, the uh, uh, electron beam has a different temperature because of the way it's created in the, in the perpendicular direction to, front to the beam than in the longitudinal direction. So if you've got a theoretical result, you have to put it through this convolution to compare it to uh, the uh, experimental result. But the Cryrean experiment uh, acknowledged that they had vibrational, vibrationally excited N2 plus but they did not know the vibrational distribution. And uh, what they did know was for each vibrational level, they were able to assess at zero EV electron energy only the product of the uh, rate coefficient from a particular level multiplied by the population of that level. And uh, with my calculated uh, rate coefficients for each level, I was then able to go back and calculate what their populations were in their beam. And they had roughly 41% of the ions in vehicle zero, 19% in vehicle one, 11% in vehicle two, and 15% in vehicle three. Surprisingly, they didn't see any vehicle four. Uh, the the uh, black line is the cry ring measurement shown here. And uh, you can see that it, it shows virtually no structure, primarily because this is an early uh, storage ring experiment done back in 1998, where they estimated, uh, uh, where they didn't get the temperature in the perpendicular direction down low enough to start to see some structure in the experiment. Uh, the uh, black, uh, or the blue curve here is the, theory uh, convoluted uh, by the uh, uh, temperatures for the, uh, the cryrene experiment. And the uh, red line is the V equals zero only. And you can see there certainly is not 20% agreement between the cross sections. But there's also no structure in the, in the experimental cross section. So it is not the best uh, comparison for testing the theory. So hopefully soon we'll have a 
a higher resolution experiment on N2+. Plus. Now this is the total rate constant for vehicle zero shown in red and all the contributing states. And all I want to mention here is that there are six contributing states, each of which has a, a rate constant above 1 times 10 to the minus 9, uh, contributing to the dissociative recombination from V equals 0. This is V equal 4, and uh, you can see that we have many more states contributing to that uh, rate coefficient, uh, having contributions above 1 times 10 to the minus 9. In fact, there are 12 states here contributing to the cross-section. Now, uh, this, here we show in the first column the vibrational level uh, that's undergoing the recombination. In the second level is the number of dissociative states that are involved. And in the third column is the rate coefficient uh, for uh, dissociative recombination at 300K. And in the last column at 1750 K electron temperature. Uh, what we can see is that if you look at the upper, if you look at the upper three vibrational levels, the rate coefficients don't change very much. Uh, you can see that here; they're they're pretty much the same. Uh, and uh, for those levels, it almost appears as if we've saturated the dissociation space uh, by, having, uh, by having gone up this high. And one would probably be uh, safe in guessing that if one goes up to V equal 5 and higher, that the rate coefficient may very well remain constant like this. Uh, and that's uh, something to think about for other uh, molecular ions. And uh, it would be interesting to do a calculation on a system where you, you saturate, purposely saturate uh, the system with uh, dissociative states and see what sort of uh, rate you come up with. Uh, now, uh, this is the, uh, oh, I'm going backwards. Now I want to say a few words about ionospheric uh, N2+. Uh, for about 30 years there was a problem in ionospheric models in that the uh, density of N2 plus uh, that was uh, calculated was twice the value that was observed. And a possible resolution uh, to this problem was proposed in 1978 and they said that well since there's so much vibrationally excited N2 plus maybe the rate coefficient for vibrationally excited N2 plus is higher than the rate coefficient for the uh, V equals zero level. But I've shown from theory that that's not the case. So that explanation certainly is not uh, uh, accurate. At the time, uh, Fred Biondi published some objections to this, to this proposal, and uh, those are supported by the, uh, by the calculations. Uh, the situation was not resolved until last year uh, when uh, Richards published a paper that included a new rate coefficient for a reaction that generates M2+. Plus namely the O plus doublet D plus N2 reaction going to O plus N2 plus. And uh, that lower rate coefficient led to less N2 plus in the models. And now there's agreement between the uh, calculated and the uh, uh, observed N2 plus density. Now on N2H plus, uh, there was a storage ring experiment done in 2004 which found a total recombination rate of 1 times 10 to the minus 7 at uh, room temperature. And the next year, a flowing afterglow result from Nigel Adams's group found a rate coefficient of 2.4 times 10 to the minus 7. Uh, so the question was, why was, this, why was there such an enormous disagreement? Uh, the most recent paper this year by the uh, Cryring group uh, Re they reanalyzed their results and found that, in fact, their, cross their uh, recombination rate coefficient that they now measure is 2.74 times 10 to the minus 7. And they claimed that their 2004 measurement was contaminated by over 80% of 15 nitrogen, 14 nitrogen plus, which has the same mass as N2H plus. So having read this, I decided that I ought to run off a calculation of the rate coefficient for N15 and N14 plus and see 
if I uh, get agreement with this early measurement by the cryrene group. And what happens is the calculated rate coefficient is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 7 uh, cubic centimeters per second for, for the V equals 0 level of N15, N14 plus. So I find it very doubtful that this experiment can be explained by uh, contamination with the isotopomer. It seems highly unlikely to me. Uh, but it is interesting to note that the rate coefficient for 15N, 14N plus is very similar to that for N2H plus uh, and uh, also close to the rate coefficient for normal uh, N2 plus. And last, I want to end on a bit of perspective, which has a little bit to do with the question I asked Christian at the end of his talk. Um, if one, in, in the calculations, one automatically uh, calculates the uh, elastic uh, scattering cross-section for dissociative recombination. This is not the Coulomb scattering uh, cross-section, which is infinite, but this is the cross-section for coming in uh, being captured by a dissociative state, uh, rattling around, and, and then being thrown back out. And that cross-section is very high, 1 times 10 to the minus 6 cubic centimeters per second. So we can easily capture, uh, easily calculate rather, the, uh, the number of captures out of every 10 or whatever uh, that lead to dissociative recombination. And uh, what one finds is that for every 10 captures, about 10 of them uh, involve just coming in, jumbling around, and being thrown out, and two of them involve dissociative recombination. So after all this work, uh, one concludes that most of the time nothing is going on. <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, but some of the time, uh, dissociative recombination is going on, and that's important. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? About the uh, N2H plus measurements, the data were not reanalyzed. The, the experiment was really done. So it was actually a completely the, new experiment. But wasn't the machine taken no. apart by then? No. The machine is only being taken apart now. So this data was from 2010. The I, th was I thought the machine, I thought the parts are already in Germany. No. So the experiment was done in 2010. Okay. The data was only published uh, a few months ago. Okay. So it's actually a new experiment. Okay. Uh, the the uh, assumption at eight percent is highly dependent. We don't really know at what point the the iron source switched over from making N to H plus to making N two. So we have we have basically two gases N two and H two. So at some point, probably over the night, the H two ran out. So of course the magnet still set up to eject N to H plus mass twenty nine. So even though there's no hydrogen there. You still get N2, it's not pure 1414. There's a few percent of 1514 in there. So, you know, you still get ions going into the ring at the right mass to charge ratio. They just happen to do the wrong act. So, at some point when the cross section is being measured in the branching ratio, we have some contamination in the measurement from N to H plus, in that sense, not from N2 plus. But we don't really know how much. So, this is basically coming from what we think is going on. We have no other estimate of what went wrong. Right, but but this statement here that it was contaminated by over 80% is in the, the, the sure, most recent that's paper. that's probably correct, but it, yeah. it, it's not like it was 80% all the time doing the measurement. At some point we had N to H plus in the beam, we started measuring. And at some point we go from having N to H plus to just having N2 in the beam. So but none of that would give a rate coefficient of 1 times 10 to the minus 7. But the iron source is hot, so it's highly unlikely we just have ground state N2 in yeah, but even with excited state N2 plus, you still wouldn't get this down to 1 times 10 to the minus 7. So. Of course, but when we do the rate coefficient, we first calculate the cross section, then we flip the cross section, then convolute this with the electron, uh, the electron energy distribution. So, of course, to calculate the cross section, you need the current. So, the current we get from you know, measuring every injection, we measure the current of the ion. But, of course, we have at some point in the night the current, average current, is, was dominated from what we measured the first six hours. And then the next six hours, we basically have a current of two picoamps. It's changing the cross section, but it's not changing the average current anymore. 
So that could just be the fact that we have a factor two there wrong in the cross section, which then translates somehow to a large error in the record. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Yeah. Uh, I didn't quite understand. How did you extract the uh, migrational population for the for the for the measurement? Well, the the cry ring measurement reported the the product of the uh, rate constant times the population for each vibrational level of N2+. plus. They did not know the rate constant for each vibrational level, and they did not know the population. They, they knew the product of the two. Now, if you say that the uh, rate constant is the same for all the vibrational levels, then you could get the population, which is sort of what they did in that paper. But that's not at all the case. The theory shows that that isn't the case. Uh, so, uh, so I took my calculated Vibrate, my calculated rate constants for each vibrational level, and from their product, I simply took uh, found the population. I don't, so if you say, let's assume that the rate constant is the same for all vibrational levels, how does the rate constant contain the measured rate constant contain any information of the underlying population? The measured rate constant, you mean the experimental rate constant yeah. does not have information it on right? right, it doesn't. But along with this additional information that was in their paper, one could then use that rate constant. And with my individual uh, calculated rate constants for each vibrational level, uh, determine the population. And this additional information in the paper was the different vibrational population? No. It was for one, it, well, they actually had two vibrational populations, but it was, this was for one of the vibrational populations. No. No. They, all they knew was for each vibrational level, by using their uh, multi-channel detector, they, they knew that uh, at zero, this, and they only did the measurement at zero EV electron energy, they knew the, the, basically the intensity coming from each vibrational level, and that's the product of the population times the rate coefficient for that level. Okay, we use the interesting experiment. Yeah. So then you yeah. can see where the vibration, excess vibration energy going into the product. Okay, I was just wondering, do you see um, frustrated VR events like uh, basically flux going into a closed association channel that, that comes back in and maybe makes additional resonances? Uh, I don't remember your potential fears, but it looked like maybe there were channels like that for the, the neutral go to closed dissociation channels? Ah, uh, well, in this particular case, there are no closed dissociation channels. All the channels, all the dissociation channels are open because they have, all the asymptotes are below. There is one uh, dissociation channel, the singlet sigma u plus state, which is closed for uh, about a tenth of an EV above the vehicle zero level. But all the others are open. Well, there must be Rydberg, a whole bunch of Rydbergs that are closed. Oh, yes. Well, of course, yes. Right. And so you're, I'm not sure I know what you're asking. Well, I guess these would be maybe sort of, in, you know, not real high Rydbergs, but sort of intermediate range Rydbergs yeah. that, that aren't so strongly closed, but uh, could, could have, uh, you know, at higher energies, they would open up as dissociation channels. And at lower energies, they would show up uh, for perhaps additional resonances. Yeah, no, the Rydberg, the Rydberg uh, asymptotic limits for these states are all pretty far above. They're more than one EV above vehicle zero. And I believe they are uh, above, uh, even for vehicle four, uh, more than one EV above vehicle four. So there aren't any of the, I don't think there are any of the states that you're talking about coming in. But that's an interesting thing to look for, in, uh, certainly in theoretical calculations. Yeah, I have a quick question. You say that uh, isotope effect in N2 plus is very weak. So this preferential escape of N14 from the Mars atmosphere is just because it's lighter than N15? It's just due to the not, energetics yeah, of the system. Yeah, not because of the isotope effect. Well, uh, this is the first chance that we've actually that there has been a measurement on the uh, 
on the uh, uh, rate coefficient for mm -hmm. N15. No, it's not the rate coefficient. It's yeah. the uh, it's the energetics of uh -huh. simply for uh, N15, N14 uh, plus. Uh, its, its energy relative to its asymptote mm -hmm. is enough to cause uh, is enough to cause the preferential escape uh -huh. of, of N N15. Okay, um. uh, did you try to pull out any information about final states? On what state? Of the final states of nitrogen that you're going to. Oh, that's coming. Uh, in terms of quantum yields. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm currently putting that together, and I'll be writing that up shortly, but I don't have anything for this talk for that. So did you, so did you, I mean, you were doing MQDT, so what do you include as a final coupling after the MQDT, or you just assume that once it's on the state, it goes, stays on that state? Well, in the case of N2, you can't make that assumption because you know, O2 is very nice. You can make that assumption in O2, but in N2 you can't because there are avoided crossings all over the place. And so you can do the calculation by, you can do landau zener and see what's happening at every avoided crossing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one thing I have done. Uh, and uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't have results to give you today on that. Okay, I think we're, Let's stop discussion at this point and let's see.